this is probably where the drama enters. But I would rather call it sort of an X factor. Because I think we all really react emotionally when we see a certain object on the first glance we, before we start to analyze it. And I'm interested as a designer is in this moment. And when I create, you know, I'm also waiting for myself to be so excited about what I'm doing. So when I'm changing the shape, when I'm putting together the materials, the forms, the colors, where do I come to this point of sort of, sort of an excitement where I feel that the object has a soul? Yeah. Um, it's, it's hard to dis- describe it in any other way. So I'm interested in this moment. And if I don't fall in love with my own object, and it's not so easy to, to do or to achieve <laughs> this right. uh, I'm not happy. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie. I'm Amy and this is Clever. Today we're talking to product and interior designer Nika Zupan. Nika designs objects and spaces. That primarily means furniture, lighting and interiors, but also includes conceptual installations. Her work is theatrical, derived from traditionally feminine forms, but strong with a distinct voice. Elle magazine has described it as punk elegance, and Business Week dubbed it technical chic. She herself says her visual language comes from deep within and is about communicating things which cannot be told. Nika was born, raised, and studied industrial design in Slovenia. Since then, she's been an exciting figure on the scene, designing for brands such as Mui, Dior, Say, and Moroso, while continuing to add pieces to her own Nika Zupan's collection. So let's find out more from Nika. My name is Nika Zupans. I'm a product and interior designer. I live in Ljubljana, in Slovenia. And I think I do product and interior design because it's the profession that somehow has the strongest voice for me, of course, to tell the story that I want to tell through my works. Mm. Ah, I like. There's a very poetic answer. I like that. Can you tell us about your childhood and the hometown that you grew up in and what your family was like and kind of paint that picture for us? Yeah, of course. So I was I was born in Ljubljana, which was a time part of ex Yugoslavia. And I had a very, let's say, normal, ordinary childhood, very happy, I could say. My parents are from science and business, so I, I, I didn't grow up with design in particular. But I could say that I was very sensitive as a child to, to my surroundings. I had a very big imagination. I, I liked to read a lot. I was like a book eater. Mm. And I remember that I, you know, always had this very strong bondage with furniture, whether I liked it or not. So the childhood that I remember, it was really smooth without any, let's say, special surroundings or circumstances uh, around it. You say your parents were involved in science and business. Were they entrepreneurial or were they working in secure professions? But they were working in secure professions, but completely far away from from the design. But, you know, I had this strong connection with art and design as soon as I entered the puberty. Like when I was 13, 14, I started to be very interested in, besides the literature, in photography, in, in movies, in cinema, in art in general. And this is, you know, maybe the time when I somehow realized that I really like product design, but I don't know why. Why? You know, it was really, it, it came somehow from inside of me because it wasn't something that I would, you know, meet every day. Mm-hmm. And of course, then I went to high school. And after the high school, I decided to study industrial design at the Academy of Fine Arts here in Ljubljana, Department of Industrial Design. And this is how it somehow started. So you felt yourself gravitationally pulled towards furniture from a young age, but Did you understand what that meant or like, did you have an opportunity to take things apart and put them together or were you mostly exploring your creativity through film and photography? 
I think I was fascinated by how strong emotional impact furniture had on me Mm -hmm. because I grew up in a very modernist oriented society. So, you know, there were a lot of multiples, a lot of, this is the furniture that I really remember from school. So really modernist furniture, the furniture that was meant for mass production. And by that, it also had these failures or or it, it wasn't always done well or you could see, you know, small mistakes. So it was a bit of, you could say, depressive, but in an interesting way. And I felt that very strongly. And then maybe, like, on the contrary, when we went to, I don't know, maybe to go to some castle and see old furniture. So I felt this difference. And I always reacted very strongly, whether it was history furniture or this modernist furniture and modernist dogma, which was really strongly present also in Yugoslavia at that time. So this was a strong pull toward furniture or how a certain environment in which you live have an impact on your daily life so how you feel so it's it's really i think objects around you create or underline your emotions and and this was something very very interesting for me yeah absolutely environment has such a strong impact on on who you become but also your aesthetic and how you see the world and the differences between all the things that surround you How did you discover the design program at school and and was it difficult for you to find the right program? I had an option already after primary school to attend sort of high school for design. But my mm. mother, she didn't allow it because she said I need to go to the real high school in order to mm. get the real education. And today I'm thankful for that because, you know, this is where I got in touch with literature, with philosophy, psychology, mm-hmm. things that I'm still now very interested in. But I was already, you know, during this high school, I was sure that I will go to the Academy of Fine Arts. There was in Ljubljana mm. to study product design. There was a certain time when I was thinking whether to go to study in London. And I actually applied to Royal College of Art, Mm -hmm. but I I didn't pass the exams. So the only option that was left and that I feel I need to, to follow was the Academy of Fine Arts, which also had a very tough exams. And it was kind of a very natural first choice. And whenever I look back, I think this, the path of design on which I was walking was more or less very smooth or very determined. So I didn't mm. take many turns. I, I knew very early what I wanted to do. And also when I finished the studies, I somehow realized that I need to have my first exhibition in Milan, that there is no need to, to have an exhibition in Ljubljana because it's too small and I wouldn't get, you know, the real response. And, you know, maybe some of my friends were looking at me and saying no you need to you know do a small exhibition in your own city and then you slightly graduate but I didn't have this feeling I I, I knew I need to show my work to professional audience so sometimes it's like I mean this sounds a bit pathetic but as it was meant to be so I was just following a certain passion inside of me and it kind of led me the right way. Yeah, I mean, that that's a big dream to show your your work at the Milan Furniture Fair. I mean, it's the biggest international design fair in the world where everybody's eyes are on all of the modern designs there. So I think that's a big dream, but it's fantastic because you kind of just knew what you wanted yeah. and you were just shooting for that particular path. And also, you know, uh, Slovenia has this very special geographic location because Milano, for me, it's only four hour drive away with a car. Mm. So, because it's on the border with Italy, with Austria, and then with Croatia, it has these geographical influences from really different cultures. And I think it's really interesting. And for example, Italy, for me, it's like an extension of my own country. So for me, in a way, it was very easy to work in Italy because also in in a practical sense, it's kind of easy to bring the prototypes or the products or to to put up an exhibition. It's It's not like you need to really organize a special transport with a boat or with a plane. And this was also very helpful. And sometimes I'm surprised that my other colleagues, let's say from Slovenia, don't feel the same because in a way for us, it's really easy because Milan is still 
it will always be, or, or at least for a few years more, the, the strongest point where you present new design. Everybody comes to Milan in April and, you know, it's really easy to sit in a car and take your prototypes there to, to, <laughs> to, to simplify it. I wonder if it, it could also possibly be like a confidence issue because sometimes people are hesitant to show their work or are maybe afraid of the criticism they would get or afraid that they wouldn't get accepted or that they, their work wouldn't be liked. But it sounds like you were pretty confident as a designer. Yeah, I, I, maybe, of course, you could say it's a confidence from my point of view. It's more of a passion, you know, mm -hmm. something that is so strong inside of you. you. You have this story you want to tell through the design, so you just do it. You don't really have any other option. So after school, did you go write and show work at the furniture fair? Or did you start your own studio and then create a collection and then go? How did that come about? Well, after my graduation, of course, I, I tried to work with some companies in, in my hometown. I was trying different things, maybe for like two or three years. And somehow my ideas, which were, of course, always very creative, didn't go through. And this is maybe also the time when I, when I realized that I need a bigger audience. And once I decided that I need to, to speak to this bigger audience, I started to develop my, my own collections, which were very limited edition pieces and when you do that you also need to be very organized in a way so I always mm -hmm. say design it looks like a very creative profession but on the other hand it's really very technical in a way you need to be able to manage very well the production of the design and let's say the organization of an exhibition so mm -hmm. I worked on all that but I would say out of passion so I'm curious, you've been in the business now for how long would you say you've been a professional designer? I, I somehow count, uh, count from my first exhibition, which was in London in 2006. So it's like it will be the 12th year this year. OK, so can you kind of help punctuate the timeline for us in the 12 years that you you've been a designer? Obviously, you start off as an emerging designer, a new voice, then you establish yourself and now you're kind of a big deal. Can you talk to us about some of the pivotal moments in your career so far, some of the biggest triumphs and maybe also some of the trickiest challenges? I think, you know, in a way, each year it was like a snowball. So each year, each Milan, something happened that was quite of a big importance and that kept me going or, or, or give me another push to to not go away or, or not to stop. So maybe for, for sure the biggest breakthrough came quite early in 2007 or 2008 when Marcel Wanders from Moi discovered my work. This was a big coincidence. And after that, he commissioned Lolita Lamp. So in 2008, I, I had a launch of this uh, Lolita Lamp, which is still one of the most iconic products also for Moi. And this, of course, was sort of a big uh, light on my work because it's... It, mm -hmm. it, out of, you know, bigger number of young designers into this selection of Marcel Wanders, because Moy at that time was really established company known for always showcasing bold products, but also new talents. So this was maybe the most, uh, let's say, important breakthrough. At the same time, I also made a chair for Moroso. Which didn't, oh. it wasn't such a loud, let's say, product, but still it was quite important to have in 2008 in, at Salone del Mobile and the Design Week in Milan, two products with such a big companies like Moi and um, Moroso. Yeah. Yeah. But somehow this wasn't enough, you know, you, you think as a young designer, OK, I'm here now, I made it. But but it's not like that in a way. OK, it's, it's a very good start, but you still need to work. And after that, I remember I had a, a quite big exhibition at Super Studio Pew. I made my own house in a way, which was also just published in a book by Fido about architecture in black. I was really happy mm. about that. So I needed to show, still keep showing my own, let's say, force, you know, my own designs, my own products. Anyhow, after that, you know, other other very nice clients came. I also started to work with the Rosanna Orlandi Gallery. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this was in 2012, 11. We, we started to work together and it's another part. It's about limited editions. It's completely different than doing a, a mass product. But I think through limited editions, you are also telling your philosophy and your approach to the design. This for sure was very important. Yeah, it, it seems like with limited editions, you have a little bit more range to really express your your DNA, your design voice. Whereas with the mass products, it's still very much you, but it's also tailored for mass consumption. So whatever that means, the product has to fit that bill. Yes. Did you did you struggle at all with those first few products for Moroso and Moy? Was it was it new to work with big companies who have big expectations or did you just fall right in line and skate through it? I think I just followed right through line. I mean, you always, you know, you're always challenged even now whenever there are obstacles with each product. But for me, it's just the beauty of this pet on which you are working. No, and I also realized how good studies I, I had. I had a very good mentor, Sasha Michtik. One of, of his objects is also part of Museum of Modern Art, a permanent collection in New York. Mm -hmm. He was really good and he really taught me the basics of industrial design. So I just followed his principle principles while executing the, the, those first, let's say, products. And, you know, they were in this very same line. So, so it was quite, again, smooth a way of working with, with these companies. And then, of course, just, just to add a more, it's really a fabulous company because mm -hmm. if they believe in one idea, then, you know, the whole company tries to make it as it should be. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you had such a smooth experience and it, it does highlight the importance of mentorship. Yes, for sure. So moving on to your creative process, your particular design voice is known for embodying poetry and theater and a certain sort of, I want to say, yeah, flair for drama without being some of the words that drama can evoke that are, that are less pleasant, like whimsical, which nobody likes. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Not to be all judgy, but no, it does evoke poetry and theater and, and so I want to know where does this come from within you is it all it, does it go back to your interest in theater and film and photography are you creating a scene for people to inhabit yeah it's, it's quite hard in a way to answer because as it might it, it doesn't look maybe on a first sight but I'm really very interested when I start to design in function in innovative use of materials I'm challenged by mass production because you need to be creative in a very small box you have mm. so many restrictions but when you are able to be creative inside of these restrictions I think something really exciting happens so I somehow believe that you know this dogma forum follows function still holds true of course it is not enough and this is probably where the drama enters but i would rather call it sort of an x factor because i think we all really react emotionally when we see a certain object on the first glance we before we start to analyze it and i'm interested as a designer is in this moment and when i create you know i'm also waiting for for myself to be so excited about what I'm doing. So when I'm changing the shape, when I'm putting together the materials, the forms, the colors, where do I come to this point of sort of, sort of an excitement where I feel that the object has a soul? Yeah. Um, it's, it's hard to dis describe it in any other way. So I'm interested in this moment. And if I don't fall in love with my own object... And it's not so easy to, to do or to achieve. <laughs> this right. way. Uh, I'm not happy. And probably this is where I, you know, add maybe iconic elements. I always say that I like to work with iconic elements, which we all know, but I try to present them maybe in a new way then in, that in the end has sort of a dramatic effect. You know, I, I picked that up from your work. There is a familiarity that comes from those iconic elements, but then there's a, a refreshing new, 
I don't know, unexpectedness from the way that you incorporate them or, or use them in your own language that does feel like it resonates with something sort of, I mean, not to sound hokey, but from a past life or from, from some sort of vague memory. And yet it pulls you toward the object and toward the future, which I think is so exciting. And it is intangible and hard to put your finger on and hard to describe. But I know that moment that you're talking about when you're working through problems with form and material and color. And when you start to fall in love with your own piece, when you start to really feel like it's so exciting, you can't wait for the world to see it. I think that's the moment of conception. That's when you really are, are birthing this wonderful new object to the world. And, and if you don't ever have that feeling, then Then it's not okay. Yeah, it's not. It's, it's, you're just... you, need to, you need to kill your baby. I mean, you need to throw your idea away. So, yeah. yeah. I'm really interested to hear more about these installations that you do because, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of your furniture, but I, I do feel like these installations that you create are, they really transport you and, and it feels theatrical, but not in a way like that Amy was saying, like it's not dramatic in the sense of, you know, drama for being dramatic, but it's very elegant, but very trans, what's the word I'm looking for? Transportive? Is that even a word? <laughs> Transcendent? <laughs> Thank you. That's kind of like that. So I, I'm interested to know like where these ideas come from and how they, do they start, do they germinate as like a seed of an idea or do you find inspiration from a specific point? I mean, Amy talked a little bit before about art and theater and photography, but is there something that you do or start with that creates these incredible concepts? when we showcased the the limited edition collections or it was the case with Miss Dior installation where I was invited by Dior to to somehow illustrate the character of Miss Dior through my own poetics. I think it's always the theme, you know. I start from this theme, but this theme is something probably that also, you know, bothers, not bothers, it's not the right way. It's something that I'm interested in, in a certain moment of my life, and I want to explore it. And I'm really interested in this emotional effect, and I also try to translate my own emotions into objects or this installation. So I to try to create a certain feeling and I think you can do that very strongly when you are using furniture you you quite quickly come to interior design if you if Mm -hmm. you follow Mm -hmm. this path but it's hard to say because it's always different and it depends Uh, as I said with Dior it was an input from Dior to show how I see Miss Dior as a character and I wanted to give a completely new dimension to Miss Dior so I referenced Virginia Woolf A Room of One's Own so I I wanted to make a feminist statement somehow uh, showcasing uh, this maybe very classical character in a new way or if we speak about self-discipline collection uh, and homework collection and the installation around that at Rosanna Orlandi I was but completely privately in, in the back of these ideas, I was asking, for example, myself, why so many creative women in history failed or, or didn't lead a very happy life or, or, you know, ended up sadly. What was, you know, in, in comparison yeah. to their male, let's say, I don't know. Uh, Counterparts. Or, yes, yes. And let's say I was asking myself, was it the self-discipline? Is it where we, you know, get too emotional and we lack this feeling of self-discipline? And this question w- was the starting point to, to, to illustrate that through installation. Do you find mm-hmm. a, a thrill when you get to extend the ambiance and the emotional poetry beyond the furniture and into the whole atmosphere? Yes, for sure. I think it's the essence of our work. And of course, we are doing this by we, I mean, designers or interior designers or architects. You you are doing this to to create this environment for other people to experience Mm -hmm. or enjoy. 
Mm -hmm. You are offering sort of a stage for their real life to, to, you know, be lived there. If you're doing a restaurant, you are doing a special environment for this restaurant. And you know that somebody will choose this restaurant, I don't know, for, for his birthday party or just for a coffee. So you are offering a sort of story stage in which people can, can enter. I love that. I also really love the femininity in your work, but it's not overly feminine where it, like men couldn't relate to it. I mean, but it's very beautiful and elegant and well stated. I mean, the cherries and the bows and things like that, but they're, they're done in a way that's just, I don't know. It's, it's really beautiful and understated and elegant. Yeah, this is, let's say, maybe a quite interesting topic in my work, which I think it's many times also misunderstood. Because mm. I'm also sort of a, let's say, very uh, kind of a warrior. Mm. I was going to say, there's a boldness about it. There's a there's an unapologeticness about it that, that isn't militant yeah, yeah. or in your face. It's more like a quiet confidence, but also a fierceness that like just is emanating from the very dna <laughs> yeah and it's it's sensual but it's not overly yeah it's not in your face yeah but this was you know really this was maybe my driving force also from the beginning because design anyhow still is boys club mm, and mm. elements like laces and ribbons and also pink color 10 years ago when i started it was you know outrageous to use pink color these are sort of elements that are that have a certain taboo about them or or they had it and i felt that i need to pull them out of this ghetto and yes. give them another meaning and when we did Lolita Lamp in 2008 with Moi we presented it in pink color and this was at that time and today pink is kind of a millennial pink the biggest trend but mm -hmm. at that time it was kind of outrageous mm -hmm. to use this color and we even had a subtitle who is afraid of pink <laughs> so this was the let's say the daring gesture the the provocative gesture so i have to say that when i use these things i use them as a sort of rebellion also the the bow chair i mean i didn't do that because i thought the bow is so cute i did it because i think it was courageous to work with such an element to take a bow to to have this courage to do a chair in the shape of the bow and of course, to do it in a way that it doesn't, it's not in your face. It doesn't, as you said it before, it has this elegance which you cannot deny. Yes, mm. historically, the use of pink or overtly feminine thing has been relegated to either childlike princessy details or soft flowing sensitive details that don't have a certain toughness or don't indicate the strength of the feminine spirit. But that's what I really love about your work is it's unafraid to be feminine, but it's also conveying this strength and sensitivity those two go hand in hand i think and it's not even in danger of you're right it's rebellious it's not even in danger of falling into a princess category or something that's childlike it's very I very think grown it's up really hard to yeah. do it's hard to do too like how do you find that balance between not being too frilly and too girly but also being strong yeah it's like it's a bit it's like walking on the edge slightly because yeah. you, you in a way know that you're not doing a big favor to yourself <laughs> <laughs> but then again you cannot you know stop it because it's so thrilling just because of that because it's edgy and i think it's really dangerous to speak about femininity or gender oriented designs i i don't think mm -hmm. there should be gender oriented designs i think they they just speak with different language to different people but these people can be you know of whatever gender or age or you know it's yeah. more of a sensibility yeah absolutely yeah it's not for a particular type of person it is a type of object with its own yeah appeal so I'm, I'm really interested to learn a little bit more about you we talked a little bit about your childhood, but I'm wondering also outside of work, how do you feed your soul? How do you feed your creativity? Are you a chef? Are you a runner? What, what do you like to do? 
Oh, I, I always say that I have a double life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we all do. <laughs> yeah, because uh, no, I, I really, so I, I'm very creative. I'm lo- I love design. But then on the other hand, I'm really into sports and nature. As much as I'm passionately into the design with this same passion, I'm into the sports that I do and also into the nature, which I need for my creativity. So this is why I didn't move from Ljubljana because I really like the connection of our city, the direct connection with wild nature. I like, you know, I I sit in a car and in 20 minutes I can be in really wild high mountains or at the seaside. And this is really important for me. But on a daily basis, I work out every day. I train karate. I, I just started this year with Kyokushin karate, which I think is a really great example of life. You, you, you don't just learn to fight and I think you learn to live mm-hmm. uh, and I also go to the gym and uh, in the summer and also you know in, in uh, warmer months of spring and uh, autumn I windsurf oh, oh, cool, cool. <laughs> I'm also designing windsurf boards this year that, that will be presented at Rosanna Orlandi oh wow cool yeah so it's so these are, let's say, two big passions that I have. Oh, yeah. You, you, would, you would like living in Southern California, I think. Yes, yes. <laughs> I need to go to Hawaii. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah and, sure. But, you know, I think I get really, let's say, energetically cleaned up by doing these things. And being that way, I think I'm more open and more creative. So I, I, I'm never inspired now by or rarely, let's say, with other artwork. I admire it and I like it, but it's not my source of inspiration. My social source of inspiration really is the nature, the, the most ordinary details. So things that I somehow encounter in these very strange places, which has mm. nothing to do with, with design or, or with art. <laughs> not always, but, you know, many times. On a practical level, what percentage of your life would you say gets filled up with nature and workout activity? I mean, I work out every day. So I make sort of a, you know, I work for, let's say, seven hours in a very creative way. So no distractions if possible. And then I do my training. Let's say today I had karate for an hour and a half. And then I come back and I work again. And during the weekends, I don't work, but I always go to the nature. So Mm. At least two times per week, I need to be whether in the mountains or, or walking near the sea. That sounds like a very healthy balance. I mean, it's hard to keep, you know, I see, yeah. I'm thankful that I'm able to do it because I think it's luxury to somehow take this time and claim it. But on the other hand, I know how essential it is for my work. I think as a creative person, you cannot, you know, overwork yourself. You always need to, to have this good energy. And I think it somehow reflects on what you do. Maybe it sounds a bit crazy, but I really believe it. I think the, the products show your state of mind in the end, your energy. I agree with you. I like the, the energetic cleanup. I think that's, that is really important. Yeah. Speaking of that, is there a problem in your life or in the world that eats away at you? Is there any sort of struggle? Uh, I mean, of course, I, I, I follow, you know, what's going on. But I try to, at this point in my life, I somehow try to distance myself or I speak through the design if there are certain topics or themes that I feel need to be addressed. So I'm, I always try not letting problems eating me away if if I understood your question yeah I mean and and it sounds you've made it so simple just don't let things eat away at you I think the energetic cleanup is is part of that probably (laughs) hopefully (laughs) but it also sounds like you're comfortable finding an outlet for things like if it needs to speak through the design or if you just need to channel it out through a good sweat or through something even more soulful like the martial arts yes yeah, I think that's beautiful. So so let's imagine yourself in the future. You seem to be on a very fruitful and positive trajectory. 40 years from now, how do you imagine yourself personally a- and the studio? Um, hmm. <laughs> I didn't pre- prepare the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. What's the first thing that comes to mind? 
If you close your I eyes mean, and think of yourself 40 years older. I still feel I'm very much at the beginning of my career and that there are much bigger things that I want to do that I did right now. So that there are strong stories that I want to tell and explore. And I really like this feeling, which on the other hand, it's not knowing what comes next or what waits, awaits for me under the next corner. So I, I'm interested in these very big games, also be, for the sake of the game itself. So I want to know how how far I can go. On the other hand, I really see myself living in nature, at the seaside. So finding this peace inside me, it's, you know, I spend every summer, I spend two months in um, Dalmatian Island where we have a house and I really feel peaceful and of course, very creative there. And I think this is such a beauty to be able to be content in a small village on a small island it sounds a bit romantic but then again it's something that i'm really interested in so you know two completely different concepts but i would be happy with both of them or maybe sort of a combination but i see myself very active in in, in 40 years well you are a beautiful example of em- embracing the unknown and being excited about it and also trusting that there is peace in that process and contentment Instead of just, you know, anxiety, which so many yes. of us worry about. <laughs> no, I think it's dangerous causes. No, really, I think it's your choice whether you go with this anxiety, with this, you know, um, demands from outside, demands from the society. I really try to avoid them and try to, to do my own uh, work and walk uh, on my own path. So, mm. But I think mm. the, the, the martial arts, they help. <laughs> Otherwise, I couldn't maybe put myself together in a, such a good way. <laughs> Speaking of the future, do you have a new project that you would like our listeners to know about? We have actually several new projects because Milan Design Week is approaching in April and this Mm -hmm. is the most important period for designers around the world and we will be launching several new collections and collaborations. We are also doing a very beautiful interior residential, a collection of frames, glasses, which is completely new topic. Uh, But it's a bit early to, to speak about the companies and everything because we always announce everything during april but there are some some exciting uh, projects in the pipeline Ooh, can't wait yeah well we would love our listeners to be able to follow along and learn more about those new projects that you have so what are your social media handles your website where can they keep tabs on what you're doing i like instagram quite very much they can all find me it's just nika zupans I think Instagram is really a beautiful tool to somehow express uh, what you are doing, what's your philosophy, and to connect with people around the world so easily. So this is, let's say, my home media. Then, of course, I also have Facebook, also just Nika Zupans. And your website URL? And uh, website, uh, again, just nikazupans.com. Always my name. Perfect. Very simple. Well, thank you so much. This has been an absolute enlightening conversation and also delightful thank you it it was a pleasure for me too as well so thank you very much for inviting me to be your guest our pleasure okay bye that is an impressive woman yes oh my goodness she is so when people say self-possessed that means like a a sort of confidence of, of self right that means not only is she poised but she understands herself so well and she's not not tap dancing for anybody's approval she's doing her thing confidently knowing that some people are going to be challenged by things that are pink or overtly feminine but connected to the deeper importance of expressing herself that way and so Mm -hmm. therefore her designs really do exude a confidence that is bold, sexy, timeless, courageous. I mean, all that shit. It's awesome. 
I know. She's so cool. I've been such a fan of her work for so long. It was such a pleasure to talk to her and hear more about her background. It's so hard to do what she does and she does it so well, like creating these feminine objects that are not overtly feminine in a way that's so elegant and tasteful. Like when, if I were to tell you like, oh, I, I saw this lamp and it looked like two cherries hanging from the ceiling, you'd be like, what? And then like the, the images in your head might be like running through like some, some tacky stuff, right? But like when you see it, you're like, oh yeah. Like that's you either not tacky, think, it's incredible. Yeah, you either think little girl or you think sort of hipster kitsch or something right. sort of, yeah, ironic. And it's none of those things mm -mm. at all. And I can't stress it. There's this interesting dichotomy in the United States, particularly if something is considered feminine, manufacturers, brands, stores, people are going to automatically assume that men won't want it. And they're mostly right. But this work, the work of Nika Zupons, is not in that category. It's not the kind of thing that men don't want to be associated with because it's girly. Yeah. It is the kind of thing that is so bold and intriguing that men aren't off put no, by it. No, it's sensual, you know? it's elegant, it's well done. It doesn't push it's not overly girly. It's very artistic and, did I say sculptural? It just feels... Yeah. No, and sculptural, yeah, you're right. But it's also not polarizing. No. It's not polarizing. In fact, it's warm and, and approachable and embracing of all people. That's why I really liked the way she described it when she talked about it having its, its own expression. It is not designed for a particular subset of the market. Yeah. It is like an individual on the spectrum of gender, you know, and it can have its own fluidity and its own identifiers and just be where it wants to be. And you can engage with it as such. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Plus, now I'm going to have to sign up for martial arts classes. <laughs> right? Don't you? I'm convinced that's, that's what I need to do to be I, my full badass. <laughs> I know. I, I feel like that, that's, I loved that she does that. I think that's awesome. I love it because it's disciplined and it's it gets all the stress out. It gets all the anger or frustration out that you need to kind of get out so that you can make the room in your brain to be creative and and do all the things she has to do with her brain. Yes, and it's also a connection to a rich culture and a, a, a deeply methodical process and a philosophy mm -hmm. it's not just a pure like sweat it out type of thing there's there's something really meaningful about it and it sounds like that poetry is something that she really responds to you yeah my so I don't know a whole lot about martial arts my my husband did it when he was younger and my daughter took a like an eight-week class at school for Taekwondo and the first mm. thing they teach you is it's about discipline and self-confidence it's it's basically confidence that's that's what it's all about and I thought that was great and so I can see that with her like that she would enjoy something that helps keep her confidence up I wonder how many of our listeners have a martial arts background or take martial arts classes I wonder if that's something I mean, I just wonder how many creatives could really benefit from that form of activity. Yeah, I don't know. I I think I would absolutely hate it, but I feel like on the flip side, like afterwards, I'd be like really grateful that I did it. <laughs> right. Like you'd have to drag yourself there, but you'd totally. never be bummed that you did it. Yes. Yes. I just worry that I might like wear that outfit all the time it looks really comfortable <laughs> it's basically just a robe in two pieces <laughs> i don't i think they teach you not to like wear it in in inappropriate situations no, like i don't, I don't think, think i can sit on the couch to. and eat pizza wearing that outfit but i, I think i might want to <laughs> 
Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and go to cleverpodcast.com to sign up for our newsletter, read the show notes and see images of Nika's work. Connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast because we totally love hearing from you. This episode of Clever was edited by Ty Navaris and Alex Perez with music by L1011.